so I'm Hélène Denis, I'm a researcher at CIRAD, I'm a veterinarian and disease ecologist. So and I'm based uh, in Zimbabwe, um, and uh, today I'm here to talk about the health of the environment and the link with infectious diseases. So given my background, I will uh, talk about animal and human diseases, but some of the concepts are also applicable to, uh, to plant uh, diseases. So and just uh, first, uh, an important uh, aspect to note is that, as you know, infectious diseases are driven by environmental and ecological drivers, but also by sociological and economical uh, drivers. So I will only give you part of the picture here, um, but uh, what I really want to show basically is that the environment and the health of the environment is really uh, central a central part of uh, the issue of infectious diseases and that uh, environmental actors really can play a key role in uh, disease uh, prevention and um, management. Uh, and the idea here of this uh, workshop is also, uh, as Alex introduced before, that the environment is often uh, quite neglected, while it should be uh, the opposite. It is very, very central. Um, so let me start from the beginning, just uh, like a healthy environment. Sh maybe I should have put ecosystem. <laughs> Um, is, uh, can be reflected through a uh, stable climate, high biodiversity, uh, persistent vegetation, uh, habitat connectivity, and so forth. And uh, human cost pressures, like uh, intensive agriculture, mining, industrialization, uh, wood industry, can actually lead uh, to uh, what we can call an unhealthy environment with uh, accelerated uh, climate change, uh, biodiversity loss, um, and also uh, habitat uh, degradation, forest fragmentation, and so forth. And these can in turn uh, impact infectious disease dynamics uh, through complex mechanisms. Um, this is not an exhaustive list, it's just so that I can give you some examples of these mechanisms for a better understanding. Uh, and I chose, I selected examples that are uh, based on well-studied systems, so they don't necessarily occur on this continent, but they can definitely be applied also. So if we look at the habitat loss, uh, the effect of the habitat loss on uh, infectious uh, disease transmission, I take the example of Hendra virus in Australia. Uh, Hendra viruses, oof. I don't know what happened here, but anyway, I also have a little problem, but it's okay. Uh, so they are uh, basically maintained and transmitted by bats, flying foxes. So basically the bats, uh, when they roost in these nice trees, uh, they shed the virus in their urine and their ex excrements, and horses can get contaminated while grazing contaminated grass. And these horses can get very sick, and they often die uh, from this disease through uh, respiratory and neurological disorders. And in the meantime, these horses can transmit the disease to people. Okay? So, and I selected this uh, example because a team in Australia led a very uh, long-term study and analyzed over 25 years of data. And when you look at environmental drivers, it's really important to look over the long term, otherwise you won't detect anything. And it's also good to have a large a spatial scale to detect, uh, to, to be able to understand underlying mechanisms. And so basically these bats, they, use nor they normally uh, forage in forests, especially over the winter. Uh, there are winter flowering um, trees, so they really rely on that. And what they see is that there's a lot of land use uh, change and forest clearance for urbanization and agricultural purposes. And so uh, these bats go through uh, periods of food shortage. And when there's food shortage, what they do is that they start roosting in smaller colonies. They form smaller groups in urban and agricultural areas. Um, and what the, the, the researchers noticed is that after food shortages and in these new colonies, uh, the viral shedding in the droppings actually increase because these factors bring like cumulative stress. So the, the, the immune system might be affected and this in turn impacts the dynamics of the viruses, uh, viral circulation. And on top of that, uh, in these new winter roosts, there's also a changing interface. So there's closer interface with domestic animals, with horses, more outbreaks in horses, and s hence an increased uh, spillover risk also in humans. And climate change on top of that causes also more food shortages. So uh, it's uh, quite complex, but at the end, uh, what it shows is that habitat change can 
impact uh, the behavior of the animal host, the abundance, the distribution of the animal hosts, and also its physiology, the immune system, and also the interaction with other species, including uh, humans. And on the African continent, for instance, Hendra-like viruses have been discovered in bats. We don't know the impact for human health uh, yet. Uh, and also very similar dynamics are suspected for Ebola virus. So Ebola virus, I put it also as an example, but it's not a, a, such a good example because the ecology of Ebola viruses remains very uh, blurry. So we suspect bats to play a role in the transmission, the maintenance and the transmission with possible direct transmission to people or through what we call a bridge host, uh, like other species of animals like dirkers and primates, which can be infected and in turn infect um, uh, people. And so a, a study uh, that looked at uh, the distribution of outbreaks um, shows that outbreaks are more likely to start in highly disturbed forested areas. So on this map uh, on top, it's like a map of the forest in Central and West Africa uh, in 2000. And then below, it's 14 years later. In orange, you see the degraded parts of the forest. And the yellow uh, triangles are the outbreaks. And basically, what they show is that these outbreaks occur where there is forest. So there is the reservoir host. There is also, of course, increasing amount of people. But mainly, there's increasing forest fragmentation. So there's ongoing disturbance. And so um, this disturbance can affect once more the behavior uh, of the bats, even the distribution. Some fruit bats might adapt quite well to these uh, new uh, um, transformed habitats. And actually, we have a student, a PhD student, who colored with GPS colors some hammer-headed fruit bats uh, who are suspected to play a role in Ebola virus uh, transmission. And so what she showed, well, what she found was that these bats actually prefer to forage in agricultural lands, which are those in orange around the purple villages, compared to uh, the forest. So all the black dots are the foraging sites, uh, and the tracks in gray, but they definitely uh, spend more time in the agricultural uh, uh, lands. So this is just to show that these habitat transformations do impact uh, or can impact uh, disease dynamics. So if we look at biodiversity, Biodiversity, as you know, uh, we've spoken about it already in different uh, uh, speeches, is very important for uh, food and water security, uh, for nutrition, uh, sustainable development, and so forth. It is really, really, really important to preserve our biodiversity uh, because um, of all that. But when it comes also to pathogens, the link between biodiversity and pathogens is very, very complex. So. For, diff for various reasons, uh, we can't speak about everything here, but mainly, uh, if you look at a global scale, uh, what happens? So we see that the pathogen richness, so the number of different pathogen species in a broad area, increases with the number of bird and uh, mammal species. So this can be explained in different ways, but in any case, uh, um, uh, that also means that when there is more diversity, more species around, there's more pathogen species, and there's the likelihood of a pathogen to be able to jump to another species, or like humans, is of course increasing. So then we can consider these areas with higher biodiversity as hotspots for infectious uh, disease emergence. But what happens at a local scale? So things might look very different when you look at a smaller scale. Uh, there are different mechanisms at a smaller scale which can uh, explain a different uh, uh, ways the, the infectious diseases respond to biodiversity. And one of them is the dilution effect. So the dilution effect says that a higher biodiversity protects us against infectious disease risks. So basically when we lose biodiversity, the prevalence and the transmission of pathogens increases. It's a very controversial mechanism because it's very complex and it only occurs in very specific um, uh, host pathogen uh, um, systems, so under specific conditions. So please bear that in mind. It doesn't happen everywhere. It's not the general. Uh, it's not a general rule at all. It's just to give you an example of these uh, interactions. And so I will explain it to you through uh, a natural dilution effect that was shown in hantaviruses in small mammals. So hantaviruses are zoonotic viruses that are transmitted by rodents. And they uh, are quite widely distributed. Uh, they are, exist in Americas, in Europe, um, and also some hantaviruses 
have been discovered in African countries, like in Guinea, in small rodents, with an impact on human health too. And a higher diversity of hantaviruses is constantly being discovered in other animals like shrews and bats. This example is in Sweden, uh, where it causes hemorrhagic fever syndrome in, in uh, humans. And basically, it's transmitted by these small rodents called bank voles. Uh, and these bank voles, when you have a situation with a low diversity of these small mammals and where these bank voles are quite abundant, they are good, uh, competent hosts. They are able to maintain and transmit the virus. And they, ha they do a lot of movements. There's a lot of encounters between animals and people. And so there's a lot of uh, transmission. But what happens if we introduce um, like the this, this, this smaller animal, the common shrew? The common shrew is not a competent host. It is not able to maintain or transmit this disease. But it's a competitor to the bank vol and a predator on the bank vol. And basically, the effect is that it will affect behavior of the bank voles who are going to um, uh, change their movement patterns and there will be less encounters and less aggressive encounters between bank voles and hence less uh, transmission, which we call encounter reduction. On top of that, if we add another one, which is the field vol, which is a direct competitor of the bank vol, um, this one will also change the, the movement and the behavior, and on top of that, will reduce the density of the bank vol population because they compete directly for resources. And there, we have a reduction of the susceptible host population, hence less transmissions. So this is an example of how this uh, can, uh, can function. Climate change, again, it comes... Yeah, we t yeah, we've been talking about it quite a bit too. Climate change can uh, have an impact uh, on diseases through different ways. So it can basically affect directly uh, immunity and physiology, not only of the hosts, but also of the pathogen. So I invite you to read, uh, I've put some bibliography at the end, some papers which explain that. Um, of course, climate change has an impact on habitat, uh, on biodiversity, etc which in turn impact uh, uh, infectious diseases. On water systems, we've been talking about cholera. Cholera has been shown to be quite sensitive also, a sensitive disease to climate change. And uh, I want to give you the example of vector-borne diseases, which are clearly impacted by climate change because vector-borne diseases are transmitted by all these little bugs like mosquitoes, flies, ticks, which are very sensitive to rainfall and to temperature. So this is an example of uh, malaria endemic in many areas, uh, transmitted by mosquitoes. And the mosquito, as well as the parasite, are sensitive to the rain. They need a certain amount of rainfall and a certain level of temperature to be able to breed, but also for the virus to replicate, for the parasite, sorry. Um, and models show that there's an increasing risk in tropical highland regions, particularly East African highlands. Uh, which are not suitable for malaria yet, but will become perhaps suitable. Typically also in Harare, we don't have malaria, but hopefully <laughs> it never happens, but it's one of the, the worries and one of the risks. Um, you have the example of arboviruses, dengue, Zika, etc., transmitted also by mosquitoes. Um, the example of dengue virus. Dengue virus so is a disease that touches millions of people. It's very widely distributed. Uh, it's, uh, it's transmitted by mosquitoes and many transmitted in urban settings. Uh, and it's the, the impact, the burden has been increasing a lot over the past years. Um, and basically uh, also models based on climate change show that the population at risk will keep increasing drastically over time. And for instance, even in France, we now have uh, um, uh, local transmission of dengue fever that already occurred. So, um, it's a, and then we have the example of tick-borne diseases. These tick-borne diseases, uh, we have examples of uh, uh, endemic diseases that uh, affect um, livestock, for instance, like teleriosis. Teleriosis is transmitted by a tick called Ripicephalus appendiculatus, which is also, uh, its distribution is predicted to also change with uh, climate change and different uh, uh, climatic conditions. And this will, of course, also impact the areas that are suitable or non-suitable for Teleria transmissions. This is in the little um, uh, squares there. Uh, and it's important to note that some areas will become suitable and some areas which were suitable will become unsuitable for transmission. So it can go in both ways. Uh, 
because it is complex. So it's not only uh, negative, sometimes it can be sort of uh, uh, positive, I suppose. Um, so all this to basically show that uh, the unhealthy environment is also really uh, a starting point. It's not the only one, um, but it can really uh, 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 drive uh, epidemics, uh, pandemics, mortality, morbidity, and so forth. So if we want to prevent that, um, we really, so we as a animal disease expert, human disease expert, we, uh, we can of course do some sort of uh, prevention, we do surveillance, we can do control, but we really need to work hand in hand with actors from the environment, so be it at ministries, academia, NGOs, private sector, and also civil society, if we really uh, want um, uh, to do uh, uh, better prevention. And like Alex pointed out earlier on, it's not just about prevention, but it's also about evaluating the impact of our actions. It goes in both ways, it's complex, we have an action, it will affect uh, uh, infectious diseases uh, somehow, and we need to be able to understand this and work together. So um, just one thing that I want to point out, uh, when we talk about infectious diseases, many people always think zoonosis, emerging, re-emerging zoonosis. Please bear in mind all the endemic diseases, even non-zoonotic diseases, we were talking about malaria or so, which originates from animals long time ago, but not anymore. These diseases uh, are as important. Uh, they have huge impacts, so they should really not be uh, neglected as they often are. And uh, the second um, point is don't forget that all these uh, factors also impact non-communicable diseases. As we saw in earlier presentations, well, yesterday, these non-communicable diseases are extremely important in some areas, even more important than infectious diseases. So I'm just, so I'm talking about this because it's my expertise, but it's not central. There's a lot of more to it, uh, so just keep that in mind. Thank you very much. Some papers to read if you want.